This video is my History of Presidential Aircraft Model Project, which I did back in 2007. I'll provide both a brief history of each aircraft, as well as how I built and finished the models representing that history. As always, I started with an internet search on Air Force One, presidential aircraft, etc. I discovered that, over the decades, the presidents have been transported by numerous aircraft and helicopters, both large and small. So I decided to limit my build to the eight primary transport planes from over the decades, and just one helicopter. I found Minicraft offers almost all the popular presidential aircraft in one 1 to 144 scale kits. The current Air Force One 747 was only available from Hasegawa in a 1 to 200 kit, which was close enough for me. Note, Minicraft has a box set, kit 14486, Aircraft of the Presidency, which is the only kit with the correct decals for FDR's Dixie Clipper. Finally, I built the Sweet Kit 14D002 VH3D Marine One helicopter. This was my third theme build, if you will. After having built the histories of the Navy Blue Angels and Air Force Thunderbirds, I found benefit in combining the builds of planes with commonalities in construction and or finishing techniques. So after I acquired all the kits, I opened and reviewed all the parts and instruction sheets to determine how I'd build each one, and a quick review of my references to determine how I'd finish each one. Then I grouped the kits based on construction and or finishing commonalities. I broke down the kits into four groupings. The Dixie Clipper kit was unique in almost every way. It's a float plane with a display stand, has clear windows, and no bare metal surfaces. It also seemed fitting to kick off the presidential project given its status as the first aircraft to carry a sitting president. Next was my first group of kits, the remaining four propeller-driven planes, the VC-54C Sacred Cow, VC-121E Columbine III, VC-118 Independence, and VC-118A-3240. The second group comprised the three largest and jet-powered aircraft, the VC-137C Air Force One, the current VC-25A Air Force One, and the U.S. Air Force C-32A Air Force Two, all with both significant bare metal and painted fuselage surface area. Lastly, I built the Marine One helicopter on its own for obvious reasons. So let's get started. While Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to fly, taking a four-minute flight in a Wright Brothers built plane in October 1910, he did so a year after he left office. It wasn't until some 33 years later that his fifth cousin, President Franklin Roosevelt, would become the first president to utilize air transportation while in office, as has every president since. That first presidential flight was on January 11, 1943, aboard the Dixie Clipper, a Pan Am commercial Boeing B-314 flying boat, transferred to the U.S. Navy and redesignated C-143. It was the first leg of FDR's trip to Casablanca, Morocco, to meet with Winston Churchill to plan the Allied European invasion. Defense officials had deemed air travel safer than a journey by ship due to German submarines prowling the Atlantic. Thus, the C-143 was giving a dazzle-like camouflage paint scheme. Starting off a 15,000-mile total round trip, the C-143 departed Miami, Florida, bound for Bathurst, British Gambia, with rest stops in Trinidad and Brazil. Once in Africa, President Roosevelt boarded a TWA C-54, which took him from Bathurst to Morocco. During the return trip, the president celebrated his 61st birthday on the Dixie Clipper, 8,000 feet above Haiti, complete with cake and champagne. Construction. I built the plane completely according to instructions. I installed the numerous clear window parts in the fuselage halves, joined them in the rear wings, then constructed the engines, wings, and sponsons, and joined them all together. Again, while Dixie Clippers are available in other Minicraft kits, only the presidential box set has the camouflage pattern specific to this plane, and that presents the main challenge of this Clipper model, its paint scheme, a large portion of which is represented by three side camouflage pattern decals, which must line up precisely with the intermediate blue painted portions of the pattern. The instructions are specific on how to paint the plane with FS25042C blue, FS35164 intermediate intermediate blue and flat white to line up with the multicolored decals to provide the full naval camouflage scheme. Finally, as this is a flying boat and has no landing gear, I painted the stand white and attached the plane atop it. Next came the first of my two groupings of kits, which contained the four land-based prop engine planes. 
Soon after FDR's Casablanca trip, the need was recognized for a special military aircraft dedicated solely to the presidency. Working in secret, the Army Air Force and Douglas Aircraft Company modified a C-54 Skymaster. The only C-54C ever constructed, it used a C-54A fuselage and a C-54B wing set, and redesignated VC-54. The plane had secure communications equipment and extensive interior modifications to accommodate FDR. FDR. One unique feature was the elevator discreetly incorporated into the fuselage just behind the passenger cabin to more easily board and unboard a wheelchair seated FDR on and off the plane. Given its unique and distinguished purpose, the White House press corps dubbed the plane Sacred Cow. Just prior to his death, President Roosevelt made his first and only flight aboard the Sacred Cow in February 1945 when he traveled to Yalta USSR for a wartime conference with Stalin and Churchill. Here we see her in the background as FDR FDR and Stalin review the troops upon arriving in the USSR. President Harry S. Truman continued to use the sacred cow until 1947, and in July of that year, in a ceremony on board, he signed the National Security Act of 47, which created the United States Air Force as a separate independent branch of service, making the sacred cow the birthplace of the U.S. Air Force. This aircraft is currently on display in the presidential hangar of the Air Force Museum. In July of 1947, President Truman began traveling in a new U.S. Air Force presidential airliner designated VC-118. The plane was named the Independence after President Truman's Missouri birthplace and hometown. With the war over and secrecy no longer a major concern, its rather ostentatious eagle design was adapted from a rejected airline color scheme. President Truman relished the plane as a symbol of American prestige, often using it as a backdrop for speeches and press conferences. An air travel enthusiast, Truman loved to join the pilots in the cockpit and exchange travel stories or chat about whatever part of the country they happened to be flying over. Today, the plane is on display in the presidential hangar of the Air Force Museum. Having used a Lockheed Constellation as his personal transport while Supreme Commander Allied Powers Europe was on display at Pima Air Museum in Tucson, Arizona. Dwight D. Eisenhower continued to use the type in its second and third incarnations, Columbine II and III, upon becoming president. The president-elect took his first flight on Columbine II in November 1952, using it in 1953 and 54, when it was replaced by the new super constellation Columbine III, seen here being christened by Mamie Eisenhower. While the nose art on Ike's planes bears the name Columbine, the Colorado state flower, in tribute to his wife Mamie's birthplace. In 1953, his VC-121A Columbine II had the distinction of being the first plane officially designated Air Force One due to a strange coincidence. Shortly after takeoff from Washington, now Reagan Airport, the air traffic controller called on the Columbine by her call sign, Air Force 8610. Shockingly, the pilot of an Eastern Airways commercial airliner in the area with a matching flight number responded to the call, setting off minor hysteria among security personnel until the confusion was cleared up moments later. Since that incident, any craft transporting the president, and only that craft, takes on the call sign 1, preceded by the service branch under which it operates, such as Air Force 1, Marine 1, Army 1, and Navy 1, which, by the way, has only been used once in 2003 when an S-3 Viking flew President George W. Bush to the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. If the craft is private or commercial, it takes on the call sign Executive 1. The 2 call sign similarly applies to any transport carrying the Vice President. While Coast Guard 1 has not been used, Vice President Joe Biden did take a helicopter tour on Coast Guard 2 in 2009. The Columbine 3 is also on display at the presidential hangar of the Air Force Museum. In the early 1960s, many airports could not yet accommodate large jet-powered aircraft such as the VC-137 Air Force One, which required longer runways than their prop engine predecessors. Here's Chicago's O'Hare Airport undergoing expansion in the early 60s, reflecting the industry transition from prop engine to jet engine airliners. Meanwhile, smaller airports, like Chicago's Midway, could only accommodate prop engine airliners. 
For these trips into smaller airports, a VC-118 transport was used. Based on the Douglas DC-6, number 53-3240 was built as a VIP transport and delivered to the 1254th Air Transport Wing in December 1955. The last propeller-driven aircraft to be designated a primary presidential transport, it served Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. Known affectionately by its tail number 3240, it had previously served as transport for President Eisenhower's Secretary of defense. During the Kennedy administration, it eventually received the same presidential paint scheme as the VC-137. President Kennedy frequently used it to fly to Hyannisport, Massachusetts with its short runway. Here we see him deplaning 3240 prior to the new paint scheme. It stayed on with LBJ flying to his Texas ranch. Here we see him and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy deplaning 3240. Today, 3240 is also on display at the Pima Air Museum in Tucson, Arizona. I built the Group 1 kits mostly out of the box, albeit in assembly line fashion. Starting with the fuselages, I glued weights in the nose cavity so they would stand on their forward triangle landing gear. I bonded the fuselage halves together with thin superglue via capillary action down the seams and clamped them together, then sanded the seams smooth when dry. These planes have bare metal exteriors for which I used metallic paints. Such finishes reveal any imperfection. I draw a metallic silver sharpie along the seams to reveal any tiny gaps requiring filling with superglue. I use flexifile sanding sticks to work down to a completely smooth surface. The independence fuselage required special attention. It was the only C-118 ever built, which is five feet shorter than the standard C-118A provided in the kit. So for an accurate independence, 0.416 inches of fuselage must be removed forward of the wing root. With my razor saw and miter box, I made two right angle cuts, then glued the two sections together. However, when I later went to stand her up, I realized I hadn't put enough weight in the nose to offset the shorter fuselage. Luckily, references showed a parking stand under the tail, which I scratch built and added. All wing halves went together with superglue and clamps, and then those to the fuselages. Like these for the C-121 and C-118, the engines are molded in two halves, with a third piston piece to be set inside. I made sure to mate the correct engine halves together, so that the exhaust ports would be on the outermost sides, such as these on the 3240 plane. I cut, cleaned, and painted all the smaller parts, like engines, propellers, landing gear, tires, gear doors, and the elevator, in assembly line fashion. For the bare metal finishes, I used the Alclad system. It consists of a black primer coat over which a metallic carrier coat is sprayed. The primer coat requires 24 hours to cure, while the metallic carrier coats dry within 30 minutes and may then be masked and painted or take decals. I made handles from wire hangers, then applied the Alclad primer to all planes and hung them to dry on doll rods across stack kit boxes. Once dry, I applied the Alclad metallic carriers. I used white aluminum number 106 on the Independence and polished aluminum number 105 on the Sacred Cow, Columbine, and 3240. Then I masked and painted the control surfaces, testers 1181 silver, the wing sections, FS-16473 aircraft gray, and the 3240's upper fuselage gloss white. I attached the engines, propellers, antenna, and sub-assemblies to each plane, and on the VC-54, the wheelchair elevator. With the planes constructed, I moved to the decals. For the most realistic look on the bare metal surfaces, I would remove most of the carrier film from around each decal. So I made full-size copies of all the decal sheets to use as guides for the placement of each window, etc., before floating and placing each individually on the fuselages. On the two C-118s, the key to achieving straight and aligned decals is to start with the decals over the cockpit, applying plenty of Microsol to get them to conform completely around the cockpit. Then lay the rest of the decals down the fuselage using the kit's scribed window, door, and porthole details as references. Finally, I made corrections and added minor details per references. Black striped decals went on the leading edges of some propellers. The independents received an observation bubble made from hole-punched rounded over sheet styrene and an additional window below the name. The Sacred Cow received antennas from the spares box and the Columbine from flat sheet styrene. The C-121 kit had too many cockpit windows and had to be adjusted. Here's the completed first group of presidential planes.
my second group of planes contained the three jet engine powered aircraft. With the arrival of the jet age in the late 1950s, the Military Air Transport Service acquired three Boeing 707-153 Stratoliner Intercontinental Jetliners. Designated VC-137B, these occasionally provided presidential transport from 1959 to 1962. At this time, two Boeing 707-353Bs, designated VC-137C, were purchased by the U.S. Air Force specifically assigned for Special Air Mission, or SAM, as Air Force One. Call sign SAM-26000 entered service in 1962. The distinctive design of two blue tones, white and natural metal, which has become the standard for presidential aircraft, was suggested by Jackie Kennedy and created by Raymond Lowy, a famous industrial designer of the time. SAM 26000 served as Air Force One for Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. SAM 27000 entered service in 1972 and served Presidents Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and Bush 41. 26000 is perhaps most widely known as the aircraft that carried President John F. Kennedy to Dallas on November 22, 1963, and returned his body to Washington, D.C. following his assassination. Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th president on board just before that departure. In 1967, President Johnson used 26000 6,000 for his impromptu around the world tour. While an attempt was made to dub the 27,000 plane the Spirit of 76, the moniker never stuck, overshadowed by the more familiar Air Force One. In 1972, President Richard Nixon made his historic visits to China and the Soviet Union aboard 27,000. And in October 1981, 27,000 carried three former presidents, Ford, Nixon, and Carter, to Cairo, Egypt, to represent the United States at Egyptian President Anwar Sadat's funeral. After replacement by the current 747 VC-25A, the pair of 707s were used for several years as non-presidential VIP transports. Today, 26,000 is on display at the Air Force Museum, open to the public. Likewise, 27,000 was delivered to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi, California in 2001 and has famously served as the backdrop for two Republican president debates. Also open to the public, my brother-in-law took these photos on his recent visit there. In 1990, the Presidential Air Transport Fleet took delivery of two Boeing 747-200Bs, designated VC-25A. The two identical presidential planes have tail numbers 28,000 and 29,000. 28,000 first carried President George H. Bush on September 6, 1990. Since Bush 41, these planes have served every president since Clinton, Bush 43, Obama, and currently President Trump. Whenever the president takes an overnight trip, the backup aircraft is always within a 30-minute trip in case of any problem with the primary plane. While aerial refueling capabilities and anti-aircraft missile countermeasures provide airborne security, the aircraft's capabilities as an airborne military command center were greatly enhanced following the events of September 11, 2001, when President George W. Bush found he was not adequately able to monitor events and coordinate with officials on the ground. The planes communications centers now enable the president to coordinate with military and civilian authorities, hold video conferences, and monitor news coverage while in flight. The VC-25A is expected to continue to provide presidential travel into the 2020s, well past the end of its officially projected 30-year lifespan, which expired in 2017. With excruciatingly detailed inspections before every trip, Air Force One is probably the best maintained aircraft on the Earth. The Air Force has announced that the next model for Air Force One will be the Boeing 747-8, seen here, slated to become VC-25B. In February 2020, Boeing began modifying the two 747-8s at its San Antonio, Texas facility. The new Air Force Ones are expected to be operational in 2024. President Trump has suggested updating the paint scheme for the new planes, trading in the iconic two blue tones over white for a more patriotic exterior of red, white, and blue. He recently revealed sketches of different choices for a redesigned Air Force One. We'll have to wait and see. When the venerable 707-based VC-137 aircraft were finally retired from the VIP transport fleet 
four C-32As, the military version of Boeing's 757-200, joined the 89 airlift wing in 1998 dubbed Air Force Two and officially taking on that call sign when the Vice President is on board. Its duties also include air transport for cabinet secretaries, heads of state, and various dignitaries. Similar to the purpose for which 3240 was used rather than the 707 in the 60s, over the decades the Air Force has employed various smaller aircraft for presidential transports such as the C-140B Jetstar at the Pima Museum, or this Gulfstream C-20B, or the DC-9, among many others. The C-32A has better short field capabilities than the VC-25, making it today's plane of choice when flying into airports with runways as short as 5,000 feet. The C-32 can fly 5,500 nautical miles without refueling. Here, President Trump holds a rally at the Oshkosh, Wisconsin airport in front of the C-32A. I built the Group 2 kits, again mostly out of the box, in assembly line fashion, with minor corrections and details per references. On the V-25 fuselage, I filled the window openings with squadron white putty, glued in nose weights and the fuselage halves together. The rear wings required only light buffing, which I left off to make painting and decaling easier later. I constructed and attached the front wings, then rescribed fuselage panel lines with my number 11 blade and set them aside for painting. The engine halves, jet fan blades, and location-specific engine mounts went together with thin superglue. I filled any pits and gaps with thick superglue, then twisted progressively finer rolled sandpaper inside the engine openings until clean and smooth. I left the engines off the planes and the exhausts out of the VC-25 and C-32 engines for painting separately. I cut all the smaller parts, i.e. landing gear, wheels, and gear doors, etc. I taped these pieces to a cardboard platform for painting separately. I painted this group of planes in the following order. First, I painted all the upper fuselages, testers, number 1145, gloss white. I airbrushed all the subassemblies with Alclad primer. I applied polished aluminum, number 105, on all the jet engines. Then I applied airframe aluminum, number 119, and steel, number 112, for various detail accents and used Model Master burnt metal on the exhaust sections of the V-25 engines. To determine the mask lines between the white tops and the blue or bare metal bottoms of the fuselages, I carefully cut full-size copies of the fuselage decals along the bottom edge. I taped the templates in place. Then slightly folding back the template, I masked directly under the separation stripes. The masking placement on the C-32 is crucial because the decals separating the white top and blue bottom are only a sixteenth of an inch wide. I then masked from the separation lines up over the white tops and the tails before applying the lower fuselage color. I applied testers number 1108 blue on the C32, silver on control surfaces, flat black on the tires, as well as over the filled windows on the VC25. I masked then airbrushed Model Master gloss gull gray, light gray, dark gull gray, and alclad polished aluminum on various sections of the fuselages and wings per plane. I attached all the landing gear and doors and glued the VC-25 and C-32 exhausts into their engines. I dry fit each engine to ensure proper location, then glued all in their specifically assigned wing positions and taped them in place until dry. As before, when applying decals on the two Air Force Ones, the key is to start with the decals around the cockpits, which require plenty of microsol to conform completely around the plane. Again, the stripes down the fuselage sides align to the cockpit decals and the scribed window, door, and porthole details. Unlike the VC-137 kit, the C-32 and VC-25 kits did not include cockpit window and trim decals. For these, I used black stock decal to fill the window openings and silver paint and white stripe decals to create the window frames. On the VC-25, the previously blacked out windows now show through the fuselage decals as planned. On the C-32 decals, I separated the gold trim stripes from the doors, windows, and words above them. I laid these stripes all the way around the plane first, and after trimming away 
away the excess clear carrier film, I used the templates to properly align the remaining decals. On the VC-137, per references, I added black decals for wing lights, and the U.S. Air Force went on the rear sides, not the nose as the instructions suggest. Finally, references showed various antenna on the fuselage tops not provided by the kits. I made them from bits in my spares box or from flat styrene stock, hand painted them, then glued them in place as per references. That completed the Group 2 build of the jet-powered presidential aircraft. The first presidential helicopter flight was on July 12, 1957, when Dwight Eisenhower boarded a U.S. Air Force Bell UH-13J, departing from the White House South Lawn for Camp David. Today, this helicopter is on display at the Air Force Museum. The first dedicated Marine One and Army One fleets were Sikorsky UH-34 Seahorses. Here, an Army H-34C and Marine HUS-1 await departure in the summer of 1958. Later that year, President Eisenhower boards Army VH-34C No. 71684, currently on display at the Pima Air Museum. And here, John F. Kennedy and advisors are returning to the White House in April of 61. Today's Marine One VH H3D is a twin-engine all-weather helicopter flown by Marine Helicopter Squadron 1, or HMX-1, and supports the executive transport mission for the President. The helicopter is a derivative of the Sikorsky Sea King, which saw service with the Navy and Marines from the 1960s into the last decade. Sikorsky began delivering VH-3Ds to HMX-1 in 1974 as a replacement for the previous VH-3A, and has been the mainstay of the Marine 1 fleet since 1978. HMX-1 also has eight VH-60N Whitehawks, the VIP version of the Navy Seahawk and Marine and Army Blackhawk, which have been in service since the late 1980s. HMX-1 also operates 12 MV-22B Osprey aircraft. On a visit to Washington, D.C. in 2015, from my hotel, I actually got to see both a Marine 1 VH-3D helicopter and an MV-22B Osprey departing from the Pentagon. A Reagan-era VH-3D is also on display at the Reagan Library. This is the Sikorsky VH-92A, which will become the backbone of the presidential fleet by 2023. Seen here landing on the South Lawn as part of a flight test, the VH-92A will accommodate up to 19 passengers and needs only two crew, compared to the four needed by the VH-3D. Suite kit number 14-D002 enables you to build one of three H3 helicopter variants, one of which is the Green 1 VH3D presidential transport. For such a small kit with relatively few parts, it required a large amount of work to render an accurate Marine 1. Marine 1 is a passenger transport helicopter with two passenger doors on the left side, front and back, and otherwise smooth fuselage sides with passenger windows. The kit provided fuselage is a rescue retrieval oriented helicopter with a single passenger door on the left and a large sliding door molded into the right side with a retrieval hoist above the sliding door. First, I had to remove the retrieval hoist. Next, I scraped and sanded off all the raised detail on the cabin sides of the fuselage. Then I scribed new passenger doors, windows, and panel lines around the cabin to match references. I built the helicopter per instructions using the optional cockpit with intake cover, the optional wheel sponsons, the optional tail rotor, and only the upper radar dome piece to match references. The kit provided main rotor blades were incorrect, ribbed, not smooth. I cut them off at the rotor spar. Then I scratch built the main rotor blades from 0.05 inch flat styrene. As I cut the strips, they slightly warped. 
I used this warp to simulate the natural sag of the rotor blades at rest. I glued them to the rotor spars using lap joints. References showed a dome-shaped cap on top of the center of the main rotor. The kit paint decal diagram shows it, but the kit doesn't provide a part for it. In my spares box, I found a 144 airline nose cone and cut it off at the right diameter with my razor saw to create a rotor cap. References also showed a rounded inlet cone at the center of each of the two turbine engines. Again, no such parts are provided in the kit. My spares box had 1-144 one jet engines, and I cut the inlet cones off two of them and glued them in the center of each turbine intake. References showed an auxiliary power plant, APP, on top of the right sponson. It's basically an egg-shaped like structure with an exhaust pipe. The paint Decal diagram shows it in black shadow, but there's no kit part for it. My spares box had a rocket of the right circumference. I cut off three of the four fins and sanded it to the proper shape. I also found an angled tube-like part to simulate the tailpipe like piece at the rear of the APP. Lastly, per references, I made various antenna along the top and bottom of the tail spine from sheet styrene and glued them in place. I painted the helicopter FS-17925 insignia white and FS-14097 field green with details in flat black, yellow, and red. When I applied the kit decals, mostly per instructions, references showed I had to correct the cabin windows to have five, not three, on the right side. I used black stock decals Decal to create the windows and also to black out the cockpit windows to match. I also replaced the kit's US flag, which was too large to scale, with one from my spares box. This completed my Marine One helicopter build. So to close out this story of my presidential aircraft history project, I entered the eight planes and the helicopter in the November 10th, 2007 Butch O'Hare chapter of the IPMS model contest. It was my first contest and quite the humbling experience. My planes just weren't up to the competition, but apparently all my scratch building and corrections were appreciated as my Marine One helicopter garnered a silver medal. Today, the collection sits in the glass case in my workshop. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comments, and please visit the Mighty JJK channel to see other model building videos.